you know, where does political will come from? Where does international political will come from? I mean, this all comes down to brass tacks on any policy question in the world is you need political will in order to um, affect change. Individually rational actors, if they're going to join an agreement, they want to do as little possible while reaping the public goods. Okay, so we're rational. It's like, okay, we're going to have a study group. You guys don't have a study group for the mid team? You know, you want to gain all the other people's knowledge without giving your knowledge away. Because that way you'll have the super answer. And everybody else will have just okay answers. You know, the goal was always to end up at a liberal arts college and in a place where I could both do my research, but really, uh, you know, have hands-on experiences in the classroom. I started my career working at the U.S. Department of State. So I, I worked there for several years before going back to get my doctorate. And in, in many respects, it informs why I went back to get my doctorate because on the one hand, I, I got interested in a lot of real world things that I wanted to study. And when you're working in the government, it's very difficult to build the quote unquote intellectual capital. And so I wanted to, uh, to go do that in graduate school. In my view, it's, a, it's a, the highest calling of public service. And so serving your country and the government uh, is a great thing. And we have a, a number of wonderful people who are still doing that. but. Uh, teaching students and then helping them on their careers and, and I have a, a lot of former students who have ended up going um, into public service in some capacity has been very rewarding. At the University of Wisconsin I lectured and we would have lecture halls of about 500 people and I really enjoyed my favorite parts were you know office hours where I get to know the students and hear about their interests and you want to follow you know their careers but it's impossible to to cultivate and maintain relationships. Um, by contrast, I mean, probably the coolest thing at Linfield that I've experienced among many things is, you know, your first day, you know, I've had several colloquium classes, a colloquium being the first year, you know, your first day on campus, you see these students arrive and then you watch them develop and they develop new interests and they end up being, um, you know, the same people that you remember that first day of college, but they have this collection of experiences and interests and passions that you've had a ringside in a seat to, to watch develop over the course of time. My experience, you know, in the government motivates a lot of the questions I have, and it has this kind of real world application. So I'm atypical academic, and in my graduate school classes, I was the one that would always be raising my hand saying, that's not how it works in the real world. Uh, and so I am, you know, intellectually um, not afraid of really messy, complex questions, which I like. And I, and I, and I think that uh, we need to prepare students um, to uh, engage in the in the complexity of the world as well. And this is where a liberal arts education, I think, is exceptionally well equipped because you get exposure to different disciplines, different bodies of knowledge, but also different very practical skills. I have two books. Uh, the first book is called The Evolution and Legitimacy of International Security Institutions. Very sexy title. Uh, the second book is called The League of Nations Enduring Legacies of the First Experiment at World Organization. And they're related. Uh, what the first book does is, is effectively ask, um, what would need to happen to replace an international institution like the United Nations with a new one, like a better United Nations, the United Nations 2.0? And this speaks to broader questions of how we as uh, humanity organize ourselves in pursuit of uh, solutions to common problems. The first book, which is published by Cambridge University Press, is really an academic, more of an academic audience. And in fact, the cool thing is though, and one thing I'm doing right now, is that at Northwestern University, graduate students are using my book for a symposium. And so they have all reviewed my book and, and I get to uh, respond. This League of Nations book, on the other hand, I'm, I'm really hoping will, will be appealing to a much broader audience because it's not just giving a Monday morning quarterback description of the League of Nations and why it failed, but really trying to seek to build on a, on a growing body of research that's asking what the League of Nations experience means in contemporary international politics and what lessons it might hold for our future.